partway through. Uh, I'm Caldrick Bogle. I am jointly head of the housing team here at Cornerstone, and I'm wanting to wish you a very warm welcome to the last of our five um, webinars for Housing Week. Um, as those of you who've uh, managed to join us on the previous uh, webinars will know, we've tried to cover what we consider to be the hot topics in housing law at the moment. And previous webinars this week have covered housing litigation post lockdown, allocation and homelessness, dealing with vulnerable tenants and housing related judicial review. And as I've said, all of the events have been recorded. And if you did want to watch any of those events again, or if you didn't manage to catch them and want to dial in uh, and watch them, there are details of how to do so on our website. And it's also possible to download the materials, the various PowerPoints and things that speakers have been using. So please do take a look at our website um, if you would like to catch up on um, not only Housing Week events, but other webinars that we've run over the course of this last 18 months or so. Uh, you will know that Cornerstone Housing Team has once again been ranked as a top tier team in the directories and a large number of our members have got individual rankings and no less than 17 of us have been involved in this week and we've had nearly a thousand delegates participate and whilst we really look forward to the face-to-face -face events where we can see you and, and, and catch up with you in person, it, the online format has meant that we've been able to reach so many more of you than the physical environment of uh, Gray's Inn allows us. So um, it, we're delighted that so many of you have been able to join us over the course of this week. Um, please do take a look at our website for our ongoing seminar program. There are events happening later in this year and then we'll be looking at designing our program for next year. So if you have any suggestions for topics that you'd like us to cover, please do tell us. And if you haven't already signed up to our housing newsletter, which is due to go out shortly, please do so. Again, you can do so, do so through the website and there is information on there about our other events and, and do feel free to share that information with your colleagues um, uh, and um, get them to sign up to, they'll receive it directly into their inbox. I uh, uh, should also um, say that there, uh, make a plug for our team books. The housing team have been busy writing and Andy Lane's uh, second book on uh, how social housing fraud has recently been published. I do take a look at that. Um, my own book on antisocial behaviour and then the big plug for our upcoming book um, is the book on additional and selective licensing that Dean Underwood's currently writing and I'm told is going to be published next year. So do keep an eye out for that. Turning to this session, it's, um, it's again a hot topic in housing law, the collection and use of personal data for social landlords. And only this week you will have seen there's been coverage on the national news about uh, the use of the ring doorbells. And I know that the um, speakers are going to be speaking about that in a bit more detail. So I look forward to hearing a bit more about that. Today's speakers are Matt Lewin, John Fitzsimmons and Ruchi Parekh. They're all experts in the field of um, data protection and information law and uh, are members of the housing team who, uh, like all the members of the housing team, have experience in representing local authorities, housing associations and government departments. And again, as do all members of the housing team, they have experience at all levels of tribunal, including in the information tribunal, should you find yourself um, uh, involved in a, ma a matter there. In preparing today's webinar, they have sought to answer all of the questions that were put when you registered for the event. But if you do have any other questions, please do use the Q&A function to ask your questions and members of the team will try their best to answer questions either as we go along or at the end if time allows. And um, before, last thing to say before I hand over to Matt is simply to say a huge thanks to members of the team for participating in this week and a special thanks to all of our staff in chambers who have assisted in making sure that things have run smoothly behind the scenes. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to hand over to Matt who's going to talk about his top tips for landlords. Thank you very much, Kuljit, and good morning to everyone. So we're going to start uh, this session looking at it fairly broadly, uh, thinking about data protection for social landlords in a broad sense, uh, and in particular, how to make sure that what you do with personal data matches up with the expectations in data protection law. Um, and I'll be talking about personal data in a broad sense too, because we're not just concerned with tenants' data, we're talking about staff data and other third parties as well. So the overviews on the slide, we'll be looking at three 
important areas of data protection compliance. Firstly, data protection policies. Secondly, tenants' rights, but bearing in mind that these rights can actually be exercised by anyone whose personal data you're processing, but for the most part, they tend to be more challenging or more contentious when they're exercised by tenants. And thirdly, we'll look at data sharing. So to start with data protection policies, um, policies are a really important aspect of data protection compliance. Um, one of the main innovations of the GDPR is to introduce a principle of accountability. Uh, accountability means that not only must you comply with your data protection obligations, you need to be able to demonstrate your compliance. So it's a little bit like that um, maxim that lawyers are very fond of, justice needs not only to be done, but seen to be done. Accountability is similar. So a good set of data protection policies is one of the best ways to show your accountability. They turn general principles, which I think John will be talking about in a bit, like data minimization, purpose limitation into real meaningful actions. So what might policies need to cover? I've highlighted a few of them on the slide and they'll pop up as we go. Um, so the first point, general and specific policies, most social landlords that we work with at Cornerstone are pretty big organisations. They manage a lot of properties with a lot of staff members, a lot of tenants involved. So this means they're processing large volumes of personal data all day, every day. So most of our clients would be well advised to have both general high level data protection policies, but also specific policies covering particular business areas like income, repairs, complaints, things like that. So a general policy that's going to apply across the whole organization and it should set out some key principles or objectives for your staff to work towards. They should set out things like uh, information security, best practices, um, information about uh, data subject rights and how to respond to uh, the exercise of those rights to things like subject access requests. Specific policies, as I alluded to a second ago, are going to reflect your particular business areas within your organisation and how they process data. So an antisocial behaviour team is going to be doing quite different things with personal data compared to, say, the estate regeneration team. So the second uh, area for a policy to cover, information security, really, really important. Um, you need to, well, you will hopefully minimise the risk, if not avoid altogether, but hopefully at least minimise the risk of personal data breaches by making sure that your information security advice is kept up to date and staff are kept informed, regularly trained, for instance, on good information security practices. Thirdly on the slide, records management. Well, good records management practice feeds into a number of important areas of compliance. So if records are um, properly and rationally arranged, compliance with your subject access request is going to be an awful lot easier. Likewise, if uh, it, records are kept secure when stored, this, this will minimise the risk of personal data breaches. Now, finally, and well, it's still a fairly topical one, given that we're um, dialing in from all over the country, and a lot of us will be doing so from home, working from home. Um, so a lot of us over the last year and a half or so have become, well, initially full-time remote workers, I imagine, and certainly I imagine most of us at least part-time remote working now. So the main data protection risk uh, presented by working from home is information security. So you might be using a personal device, it might be shared with other members of your household, it might be on a home internet connection to do your work, and others might be using, um, you know, a company-issued device. This presents a potential security risk, in particular, unauthorised disclosure of personal data or unauthorised access to personal data or, uh, un well, or the loss of personal data. So some of the areas, well, you, what I mean is you need to address this, or it would be sensible to address this in a specific working from home data protection policy. So think about a couple of areas here. Devices, firstly. As I mentioned a second ago, what the question is, what devices are you and your colleagues using to do your work? Company devices or um, personal devices with a remote access option or just uh, uh, your own device with no remote working capability, each will present different data protection risks which need to be addressed in a policy. Data storage, are you using a cloud storage solution? Is it an appropriate one to be using? Are you using it appropriately? I'm thinking particularly here of using um, servers based in the EEA, the European Economic Area, to avoid uh, 
the, the kind of legal complications involved in transferring personal data outside of the um, EEA and crucially encryption. Uh, video conferencing is slightly less of a contentious issue than it was perhaps a year or so ago. Um, I think for me, and I, uh, maybe it's a common view among people on the call today, I think the problem really, the security problems with um, video conferencing, things like Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, is not so much the inherent flaws in the system, and a lot of those have been ironed out as we've gone along. <clears throat> it's more the uh, user incompetence. So they were designed for things that we have uh, they were designed primarily for business to business conferencing and obviously we've been stretching them and using them in new and novel ways um, but I think actually a lot of the concerns have been put to rest I know at least some of our local authority clients and we do a little bit of work with various police forces as well have been told not to use zoom or to use zoom without using a camera well I'm not an I'm not a cybersecurity expert so um, but I think most of us have found that to be absolutely fine and the last point on the working from home policy is what are you going to do about communicating with your colleagues? Um, how are you going to make sure that you're uh, communicating effectively? Um, email um, is obviously our primary form of communication um, online, but it's sometimes a slightly inefficient form of communication and things can go missing. They can be sent to the wrong uh, recipient, all sorts of risks involved with that. So make sure that's covered. Ensuring that your colleagues are using proper, secure methods of communication obviously crucial in an era of remote working. So next slide, please, John. That's it for policies. We're now just gonna think quickly about tenants' rights. Now this area can be a little bit of a minefield, um, especially because in our experience at Cornerstone, it's increasingly being used as a litigation tool. So it's quite common, and I'm sure lots of us, lots of you on the call will have seen, subject access request comes in as part of preparing some kind of claim or while a claim is ongoing. Um, and failure to comply with data subject rights can result in complaints to the ICO, they can result in separate litigation, so it's really important to get this right, uh, and that means setting up processes early uh, so that you're able to respond efficiently and correctly when requests come in. So I'm focusing here for the most part on um, requests made by tenants, which they, as I said, tend to be most contentious. But, uh, you know, the principles that we'll cover in the next minute or two really cover any um, anyone exercising a subject, uh, a data subject, right? So as I said, that could include staff or other third parties that you've come into contact with and you're handling their personal data. Um, now, not all data subjects uh, not all data subject rights are going to be covered today, or at least I'm not going to cover them today. Um, the ones that tend to come up uh, more often in practice and the ones which are more cont contentious are the ones I'm going to focus on. So starting with the right of access, this is known as a subject access request or SAR, a SAR, and its purpose is to give individuals a copy of their personal data. Now, importantly, uh, that's not the only thing that you're required to do. Um, you have to give confirmation that you're actually processing their personal data, sometimes, well, quite often overlooked. In most cases, it's not going to be controversial. If you hold personal data and you're disclosing it, implicitly you're confirming that you're processing personal data, but it's always good to state that in writing. Uh, and you also need to provide what I call wider processing information. So if you're familiar with your organization's privacy notice, it's similar kinds of information. What are you doing with the data and why? What data are you processing? Who are you sharing it with? How long are you holding it, hold, holding onto it for? Things like that. Now, what most people I think will be familiar at least with the outlines of the subject access request, but a few things uh, that it's important to know, the request can now be made verbally. It no longer has to be made in writing. That's an important change brought in by the GDPR. It can be made to anyone or any part of your organization. So it's important that all of your colleagues in your organization have at least an outline knowledge of subject access requests, know how to recognize one and know who to pass it on to so that it's dealt with within the time limits. Time limits also important, you've got one month to respond. You can extend time where the a request is complex or your requester is a what I call a re repeat customer, but um, that's not that shouldn't be done as a matter of routine um, and it's generally not, well, the ICO is not going to necessarily look favorably for routine extensions of time because you're not picking up requests quickly enough and you, and you haven't got the processes in place to make sure that you can deal with them within a month. 
The final point here to make is that the right of access is to data rather than documents. And that can be a slightly difficult concept to explain. It's not like a freedom of information request. You've no right to be given uh, access to a copy of a document just because it happens to have your name in it. The question, I mean, you can, you can go a lot deeper into it than this, but the basic question is, is the document about them or is part of the document about them? If it relates to them in some significant sense, then it is personal data and it should be disclosed. But if it's just a, a stray reference uh, in a document that's actually about something else, it's not personal data, doesn't need to be disclosed. So the second uh, tenant, right, we'll be looking at rectification. So most, uh, a lot of people, a lot of members of the public are familiar with the right of access, less familiar, although increasingly familiar with the exposure uh, of data protection in the kind of general conversation, thanks to GDPR, rectification is one of the rights that I'm seeing more and more of. Um, so this is the right to have inaccurate personal data rectified or corrected, in other words, or completed if that data is incomplete. So data will be inaccurate if it's incorrect or misleading as in, you know, in reference to some factual issue. In most cases, it will not apply to expressions of opinion, which are inevitably subjective, they're not factual. Um, so examples of when this may be relevant for social landlords to consider. If something negative, something adverse is noted on a tenant's file, they may not like that and they want to get that removed or corrected or at least have a challenge to that uh, note recorded on the file to say that they dispute the accuracy of that note. Um, to give an example, it might, you, might, uh, be, you might have a sensitive let and the tenant is that an applicant is therefore denied, is, is not allocated that property due to something in their background, something held, some information that's recorded on their file, and they might wish to contest that information by seeking rectification. Okay, so if you want to uh, maintain that information, you'll need to be able to justify it to the individual. If data is rectified, then any third party who received the inaccurate data should be contacted and informed that the data was inaccurate, it's now been rectified. Um, if we move on to the next tenant's right, restriction, objection, and erasure. Those are actually separate rights, but I've kind of bundled them together for convenience. So in broad terms, this is a right to limit or prevent personal data from being processed. So a restriction means a temporary limitation on the processing of personal data. It's usually exercised as a holding measure while a decision is being made on a request for rectification or erasure. An objection means preventing data from being processed for particular purposes or altogether. It's an absolute right where you're engaging in direct marketing, but it's otherwise not an absolute right. So for most, you may well get a lot of requests um, objecting to your processing, but if you're doing it for you know, general housing management functions, you can continue to process even where an objection has been uh, submitted, uh, but it will depend on what exactly your lawful basis for processing is and what your justification for overriding that objection is. Finally, um, the right of erasure. This is the uh, better known as the right uh, to be forgotten. It's relatively well known thanks to high profile litigation involving Google and the rather cynical warning that Google now puts at the bottom of its um, search page explaining that this might not be a complete record um, of information available online. Um, it applies in certain circumstances and will include where it's no longer necessary for you to hold personal data for the purpose it was originally collected for or where it's been found that you've been processing data unlawfully. Finally, on the slide, breach notification. Um, there's a right where, um, where personal data has been compromised in some way, where there's been a personal data breach. Uh, for individuals whose personal data it is to be notified, but that's not routine. It's only where there's a high risk to their rights and freedoms. So hopefully in most cases, the data loss will be minimal or it has been successfully contained. There won't necessarily need to be a right to notify the individual, but uh, I've certainly seen plenty of pre-action letters where they, the solicitors will point out, well, have you notified the ICO? Now, in most cases, it won't be necessary, but it won't it will be necessary to confirm that you haven't done that. And it's important too to, to record the reasons why you've decided not to do that, having consulted with your data protection officer. So final section in, in my talk is data sharing. I'm thinking mostly here about um, 
sharing uh, information outside of the organization with third parties, but it's also an issue when you're sharing data internally as well, especially for local authorities sharing data between different departments. There are really two kinds of data sharing that, um, well, it's helpful to categorize them, I think, in two ways, routine and occasional. Ideally, a policy should be in place to cover both situations. So occasional data sharing refers to one-off, emergency or unusual situations in which personal data needs to be shared with a third party. And routine obviously suggests that you're routinely sharing personal data with other organisations. So data should be shared in ways that are governed. Uh, John, would you mind popping over to the next slide? I think I've got some more material. Yeah. Um, by established rules and protocols. And that can be achieved with a data sharing agreement or a data sharing protocol. So I've highlighted a few areas that that policy might want to cover. So partners, identifying who you're going to be sharing data with routinely. So these should be organisations that you've entered into a data sharing agreement with. Um, when and what to share. So what are your triggers for sharing and what kind of information are you routinely going to be sharing? Um, there should be something about cooperation. It's sometimes uh, difficult to get the information you need because other organisations or people within those organisations don't understand data protection rules. So some kind of um, provisional cooperation would be useful, some kind of um, dispute resolution method in some cases. And finally, there should be something on information security. If you're, hand, if you're passing over personal data outside of your organisation, it's really important to um, ensure that that outside organization has proper information security protocols in place to protect it. Okay, I think that's everything uh, from me. I'm now going to hand over to John. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. So just thinking then about CCTV recording for landlords, because this seems to be sort of a hot topic that we're coming across on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to talk to you about three things. Um, first, the principles that you need to think about when you are either implementing a CCTV scheme or um, sort of sanctioning a CCTV um, at your tenants' uh, residences, uh, the guidance that's available to you when you're thinking about CCTV, and then the importance of carrying out DPIAs. Um, because of course, CCTV is pervasive now in our everyday lives. I think if, for those of you who are living in London, um, there's estimated to be over 500,000 cameras across the city and the average Londoner gets caught on camera, at least in the pre-COVID days, about 300 times a day. So it really is um, something that we need to bear in mind. Um, the first question, of course, we need to consider is whether CCTV collection will involve the collection of personal data. And generally speaking, we know it will because we know that the definition of personal data in Article 4 of the GDPR will be any information from which a natural person is identified or identifiable. So generally speaking, CCTV will identify a natural person, a living person, and therefore will fall within the scope of the UK GDPR when you're thinking about data protection. So um, bearing that in mind, uh, we're going to look first at the principles that you need to think about when you are either collecting CCTV, using CCTV, essentially doing anything with CCTV because you're processing personal data. And the principles that we um, hopefully are familiar with are set out in Article 5 of the UK GDPR. And I say UK GDPR because, of course, it's now called uh, the UK GDPR since we left the European Union at the beginning of January 2021. Um, so effectively what the UK has done is wholesale adopted the EU GDPR and um, but just changed one or two minor things and called it the UK GDPR. So all of the same principles and uh, various other data rights like Matt just talked about still apply in the same way as they did before Brexit. Um, and so in relation to the principles that you need to be thinking about, um, and there are six in Article 5, but these, I think, are the foremost important when, you, when you're thinking about CCTV. Um, first, you have the lawful, fair and transparent principle. And what that effectively is saying is that whenever you are um, involved in, in, in processing personal data, um, and in particular in relation to CCTV, you need to have a lawful basis for doing so. 
And so you need to identify um, where that lawful basis is. It might be in Article 6 of the UK GDPR. It might be also in Article 9 if you're processing special category personal data. Um, but you should be able to point to some sort of lawful basis for anything you're doing with um, CCTV. You should also bear in mind the fairness issue, which is that you should be thinking about the reasonable expectations of a data subject. So, you know, cameras should be not hidden away in indiscreet locations, but should be fairly obviously placed so that data subjects are aware that they're being filmed. And that links into the transparency obligation, which of course is the fact that you need to be clear and explicit about how you are processing um, people's personal data and the fact that you are processing personal data. And of course, the way we fulfill the transparency obligation in the context of CCTV is usually to have a privacy notice. Um, so that will be something like a clear notice up on the walls where the cameras are, um, setting out something like what is being done. So you know that images are being monitored. Uh, why is it being done? So the reason may be the prevention of crime or public safety reasons. Um, and of course, who is controlling the scheme? So the name of the landlord or a, uh, with a number to call or an uh, email address or website um, so that people can access uh, further information and of course vindicate any of their uh, data subject rights should they wish to do so, like making an access request. Um, so for example, the ICO has guidance, which I'm going to come to, which suggests that at a bare minimum, a transparency notice should say something like, images are being monitored and recorded for the purpose of crime prevention and public safety. The scheme is controlled by X Borough Council or X Housing Association. And for more information, call this number or go to this website. The next uh, principle is the purpose limitation principle. And that's really important in respect of CCTV because you need to at all times be able to justify your use of CCTV by reference to a purpose. And again, that purpose will usually be something like um, preventing crime, antisocial behavior, public safety, you know, linked to your housing management functions, um, essentially. Um, but what is important is that the purpose should be continuing for the entire time you're carrying out the processing. So um, just because the purpose exists at one stage when you initially set up the scheme doesn't mean you can then just um, have the scheme set up and forget about whether it still serves a purpose. The purpose should be continuing from, uh, from the moment the scheme is set up. Turning then to the storage limitation principle, and we've had a few questions in advance of this webinar about storage. Um, this is something, of course, you have to have, bear in mind whenever you're processing any personal data. Um, but it's particularly important in the context of CCTV because CCTV is a huge amount of personal data and it's um, obviously being built up on um, your data storage devices regularly. Um, so in respect of storage, from a practical perspective, you should bear in mind that storing lots and lots of CCTV costs money in terms of backup and data storage. So you don't want to store it for too long, really. Um, so Really, the ICO suggests that footage from a um, surveillance system shouldn't be kept for um, five weeks, say, merely because the manufacturer's settings are sort of set as that as five weeks as a default. You need to be thinking about your own needs and how long you think you need to store the data for. Um, and you shouldn't be storing data as a just in case. You should have a, a purpose for the storage. And generally, we advise and um, people who are storing CCTV to only store it for a few days, really, because if there's been any incidents, they'll have been reported to you and you'll be able to um, access the CCTV. You don't want to store more than that because that gets you into all sorts of difficulties with subject access rights where you're having to trawl through really old footage um, because someone has made a subject access request or indeed a rectification or other request of you. Um, so bear that in mind with storage and, and, and more generally speaking, just to pick up on one of the questions that was asked um, before this webinar about good practice in terms of storage, what you should be always thinking about with storage of personal data is retention schedules, uh, making sure that retention schedules um, are monitored and are sort of reviewed every year or so. Um, and not only that you have retention schedules, but that someone is actually implementing the retention schedules and has responsibility to implement the, the retention schedules in your organization. Finally, then in terms of principles, 
you have the integrity and confidentiality principle. And sometimes that can sound a bit woolly, but what it really is about is data security. Um, and when we think about data security in the context of CCTV, what we're really thinking about is limiting the people viewing the CCTV to those who actually need to view it. Um, so, you know, the CCTV shouldn't be accessible across your organization. It really should only be accessible by those um, who are responsible for uh, the matters that arise in the context of CCTV. And um, so if CCTV is being shared, which it may be shared with third parties like the police or social services, you also need to, of course, make sure that you're sharing it by secure means. Um, so just always bear in mind just to have that um, in the back of your mind, the security requirements around processing CCTV. So those are the, the kind of principles that you should always bear in mind. What about guidance for those of you who um, require assistance with managing and setting up CCTV schemes? Well, there's a number of documents which are particularly helpful on this matter. Uh, the first of those is the ICO code of practice and um, the ICO also has a CCTV checklist. Um, now, the ICO code of practice was written a few years ago now, uh, so before the, the GDPR, um, and it has the usual proviso at the beginning of that guidance, as, as a lot of ICO guidance that hasn't been updated has, which says effectively that the following information hasn't been updated since um, before the Data Protection Act 2018, um, although there may be some subtle differences between uh, then and now, uh, the guidance in this document um, is essentially uh, useful information uh, to those who are reading it and, and the guidance will be updated uh, soon. Hasn't been updated yet, uh, but it is, as I say, still useful. And what that guidance reminds us about is that surveillance systems can be very privacy intrusive um, because, of course, they're capable of placing a large number of law abiding um, citizens under surveillance uh, and recording their movements as they go about their day to day activities. Um, so really, before you uh, sort of jump in to just getting a CCTV system in place, you should think about carefully whether or not you want to use a surveillance system and whether or not it may sort of create an oppressive environment uh, in the housing estate that you manage. And the example the ICO code gives is you know cars in a car park are being frequently damaged and broken into at night um, and before you sort of jump to getting CCTV you might for example consider whether improved lighting would reduce the problem more effectively so it's that kind of thinking of maybe more proportionate responses than just jumping to a very um, a wholesale sort of systematic monitoring of the residents in, in the estate that you may manage. Um, and as I say, there's also a CCTV checklist from the ICO, which is useful because you can go through various processes um, where it's sort of a tick box exercise, which reminds you of the things that you need to bear in mind if you're setting up any scheme. The second uh, piece of guidance that's very useful is the Home Office Surveillance Code of um, Camera, or Code of Practice rather. Um, and that is a, a code that has to be followed if you're a relevant person under the Perfect Protection of Freedoms Act. And so um, anyone who's from a local authority here, you are a relevant person under Section 33 of that Act. Um, and so that, got, that code was written actually in 2013, um, but the government is finally consulting on revisions to the code uh, to reflect the changes in the legislation that have happened in the last 10 years. And so the consultation actually just finished in the middle of September. Uh, so there's now a draft code of practice online. I'm going to have the links to all of these, by the way, in the final slide. So you'll, you'll have access to them should you want to, to read them. Um, but there is a draft code in place. It doesn't change the, the old code in, in too great a degree. Um, and there's still um, basically 12 principles uh, that is, are set out um, in a guide accompanying the code that are very useful to bear in mind. And a lot of those principles really link back to the things that are in the ICO code, which is things about making sure the CCTV system is transparent, uh, making sure there's accountability around the CCTV system. So, you know, who's responsible for it? How do I contact someone who's made the recording? Um, and clear rules and procedures as to how you're dealing with the CCTV, if there's requests for it, um, you know, in terms of, sh of sharing it or anything like that. Um, alongside uh, that code, there's also a checklist. Um, so there's, uh, you not only have the, the ICO checklist, you also have the surveillance camera commissioner checklist. 
And that asks you to consider things like, um, what is your system for? So fundamental questions like, what's your CCTV system actually for? Are you reviewing its use? Um, have you carried out a DPIA, so a data protection impact assessment, which we're going to come to in a bit more detail? Um, do you have the signage in place? Who's responsible for it? How long are you keeping images for? What's your policy on disclosure? All those questions that are really quite fundamental to making sure that you're complying with the relevant legal regimes. Finally then, in terms of alternative sources, on top of those two, uh, what you also have um, which I think is actually a very useful uh, tool for particularly local authorities, is the annual reports of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner. And uh, these tend to um, sort of lag a bit so that the most recent report published was in December 2020, and I think that was the 2019 annual report. But it gives very useful insights into best practice and indeed where local authorities have gone wrong in how they are surveilling um, the, either their tenants or more broadly, um, just general areas um, that the public are accessing, such as um, you know village green areas or high street areas and all of that kind of thing. So that's quite useful guidance too. So that's the guidance. And then um, one of the things that you always need to be thinking about with CCTV um, are DPIAs. So as I say, a DPIA is a data protection impact assessment and these um, used to not be compulsory, um, but they were simply encouraged. And then in Article 35 of the UK GDPR, there were certain circumstances identified which said that a DPIA uh, is compulsory or mandatory. Um, and the mandatory circumstances basically apply to any time you're introducing a CCTV recording because you have to do a DPIA when you're going to be engaged in systematic monitoring of a publicly accessible area. So really, in those circumstances, the DPIA is required. And what a DPIA essentially is, it's basically examining the privacy impacts of a scheme and then trying to think about ways to mitigate the privacy impacts um, through, a, through a sort of a five or six stage process. Uh, for those of you who haven't come across them, there are very useful templates available on the ICO website uh, where you basically go through each step carefully. And this isn't something that has to be done by a lawyer or someone necessarily with data protection experience. I have a lot of lawyers who instruct me who eff effectively outsource the DPIA to their, to their clients within the organization and then sort of just um, review the DPIA because it forces everybody to turn their mind to what exactly we're doing how it's impacting on, on privacy concerns and how we can minimize that privacy impact. Before I turn to the last slide, I just want to, to, to take a moment because there were one or two questions about the use of CCTV um, uh, on the front doors of homes um, or generally uh, by individual tenants in a kind of more personal context. Uh, and I think generally speaking, that type of CCTV will fall under the householder exemption of the GDPR, um, and which effectively means that if you are just recording within um, your household or um, you're effectively exempt from complying with the requirements of the GDPR. Um, but difficulties arise when the CCTV uh, is effectively filming areas outside of the household, so onto the public highway or into the neighbor's garden or um, you know, effectively into, say, a park across the road or something like that. Um, and in those kind of situations, the, the tenant is probably going to become a data controller with all of the attendant obligations that exist on data controllers, like having to have a privacy notice, like having to comply with the principles we've just talked about. Um, so in terms of how you as social landlords can deal with that issue, I think there's two things to do. First of all, it's to warn tenants um, that uh, they may become data controllers if they want to put up their own CCTV or something like that. But second of all, you could, of course, um, have clauses in your tenancy agreements which require tenants to, to seek permission before they put up CCTV. And um, I think that's quite important. It's the same way that you would have clauses for things like satellite television, you know, satellites being um, affixed to the sides of, of, of a flat or, or a house. Um, and I think, you know, from a perspective of avoiding nuisance between neighbours and sort of accusations of harassment and, 
you know, those difficulties that can arise uh, between disputes between neighbours. I think it's quite important that you do have something in your tenancy agreements uh, in respect of, of, of needing permission for CCTV cameras. Um, those of you who may have uh, been following the news yesterday may have seen that there was a story in, on the BBC uh, involving a county court uh, decision in Oxford concerning a woman named Dr. Fairhurst who uh, was living in a privately, um, private home and her next door neighbours got an Amazon Ring doorbell and uh, they had actually invited her around to um, view their new you know, security setup, which they ostensibly had put in place to deter um, burglars from uh, visiting the home. But she found it very disturbing because not only was the um, Amazon doorbell recording sort of across towards her property, it also included an audio recording um, ability. And uh, in, in that case, which was before Oxford County Court, just as I say, um, earlier this year, and the decision was yesterday, the judge found that the person who had installed the ring doorbell was in breach of the GDPR and was um, effectively harassing um, his neighbour, Dr. Fairhurst, um, because of uh, the fact that there was this very intrusive audio recording um, of anything going on outside the property and also um, was capturing her images when um, she was outside of his property as well. Uh, so it's something to, again, bear in mind. Some of you even in your personal lives might want to bear that in mind as well if you have ring doorbells, uh, just that you may be uh, liable uh, in a county court claim against your neighbours and, and, you, and you have to, if you are recording anywhere outside the property, whether it be audio or film, uh, bear in mind that you might be subject to the obligations of the Data Protection Act. So finally, as I mentioned, this slide here, you have um, but just the documents I mentioned, obviously all these slides will be uh, distributed to you. Uh, you've got the ICO code of practice there, you've got the IC ICO CCTV checklist, the surveillance co camera code of practice, that's the existing one. There's a guide to the 12 principles in that. Then there's the draft code, as I say, that's been consulted on. And you've also got a DPIA template there from the ICO. So hopefully that arms you with the tools that you need and uh, when you're thinking about CCTV. But of course, if there's any questions, um, about this issue, um, feel free to drop them in the chat now, or of course, you can email any of us after uh, my talk or after the talks are finished. So that's me finished. And finally, we're going to move on to Ruchi, who's going to sort of take a deeper dive into subject access requests. Ruchi. Thanks, John. That was um, really useful um, stuff on CCTVs. So, um, as John mentioned, I'm going to John um, do subject access requests, and I'm um, conscious that Matt has obviously given you a flavour of what's involved. Um, but we thought we would take a slightly, um, you know, deeper look into some of what's involved. Uh, not least because we had a number of questions in, when people were registering for the seminar. But also my experience at least is that SARS or subject access requests, I'll probably refer to them as SARS because it's such a long term. But my, that my experience is that SARS tend to fill um, housing associations and local authorities with absolute dread. Um, and, you know, I fully accept that they can be time consuming, they can be costly and confusing. And often they're just a mechanism um, to add nuisance to litigation or to undertake a fishing expedition prior to litigation but that's not to say that you don't need to take them seriously and you don't need to comply um, so what I hope to do over the next um well I'll try and do it do this within 10 minutes um, um, but what I hope to do is to clarify what this actually involves in terms of principles and procedure and also provide some practical tips to assist with the handling of any future SARS. Um, so John, if you can just move on uh, a couple of slides actually. Um, I'm going to start with principles and the first point here, which is what Matt's already covered, is you know what exactly is the right of access. And this is in Article 15 of the GDPR. And effectively, individuals have the right to obtain, you know, confirmation that you're processing their personal data, a copy of such personal data, and other supplementary information. Now, um, I won't go through the list, but effectively what supplementary information you need to provide is actually set out in Article 15. Um, and as Matt mentioned, 
um, you know, if you've got a good privacy notice, it will actually entirely correspond with what's already in your privacy notice, because it's things like the purpose of your processing, the recipients of personal data and, you know, that kind of thing. And so the ICO has, in fact, advised that where you've got a sufficiently robust privacy notice, when you're responding to a subject access request, rather than setting out everything again, um, you would be entitled to just um, sending um, across a copy of your uh, privacy notice. Um, the second thing then about this um, that I want to talk about is the scope of the subject access request. Now, many of you um, who've had to deal with this firsthand will know that it is extremely broad in its scope. This is a wide ranging right and controllers are expected to check absolutely um, all relevant systems across all departments and uh, tenants will be entitled or you know, whoever it is making the request individuals will be entitled to you know, personal data across various forms of documents or records so you need to think quite broadly you know think about minutes of board meetings or performance review notes or interview notes or emails including in archives so you need to kind of think of all these various um, documents or records now this is naturally a very big task for some organizations so hopefully the gdpr does clarify that um if you, as a controller, process a large quantity of information concerning an individual, then you are entitled to go back to them and request them to specify uh, or narrow, the, well, not narrow, but rather clarify the um, request and to ask them what exactly the information relates to so that you can conduct searches accordingly. Uh, you know, for a lot of um, our clients, especially local authorities, this is quite a useful tool to have, although I have to say it's probably less helpful when the individual comes back and refuses to specify or narrow their request, because in such cases you are still expected to comply with the request in its entirety, um, but by sort of acknowledging that all you can do is make, you know, reasonable searches for the in information. Um, in terms of scope still, it's worth bearing in mind that unlike the FOIA regime that some of you may be familiar with, there is no limit on how much time you need to spend on these requests. So, um, you know, the fact that it's going to pose a huge administrative burden and take up, you know, one week of one individual's time and actually collating a response, that unfortunately is not a reason to refuse it. Um, and then the final point on scope is that it's just worth remembering at all times that um, you know, you're meant to treat subject access requests in a purpose blind way. So you can't look behind, um, you know, the person's motive and use that as a reason to refuse. Although um, I'll just say a little more on that in a moment. Um, and actually, that probably does segue into exemptions. So I've used exemptions as a catch all, but actually, there's lots of different things within this. Um, and the first thing um, which ties in with the purpose blind stuff that I was just mentioning is that you can refuse to comply with a subject access request if it is manifestly unfounded or manifestly excessive. Now, uh, unhelpfully, these terms are not defined in the legislation and there is no reported cases on the precise scope of how these exemptions will work. Um, but there is very detailed ICO guidance on the subject, so I would really urge you um, or recommend you to consider this. But in essence, manifestly unfounded may apply where an individual clearly has no intention of actually exercising their rights. So, for example, they might say things like, well, I'm making this request, but I'll withdraw this request if you credit my rent account with £100 or something like that. Um, or other examples that I've come across is where, you know, requests are repeatedly made to one employee and it seems to be sort of a targeting harassment type of tactic as opposed to anything to do with um, data projection. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, given the time that we have, I won't go through all the other examples, but um, you know, if you feel as though it might be manifestly excessive or unfounded, I would just ask you to consider the ICO guidance on this. The next thing to consider then under exemptions, and again, it's not really an exemption, but it's highly relevant, I think, particularly in the field that many of you will be working, which is what do you do when the um, uh, request is made, but that the data that you're processing um, also contains third party data. And, you know, this crops up time and time again in when we're advising, um, particularly, uh, you know, housing associations and local authorities, because the reality is that where, uh, you know, you have sort of problematic or um, difficult tenants, the reality is that, you know, their, their housing tenancy file will contain lots of third party data in terms of complaints made either, you know, neighbour complaints on ASB or things like that. So this is something that is, um, you know, it's not straightforward, there's no easy answer, but um, 
the, the first thing to note with third party data is you know whether it's actually possible to comply with the request without actually disclosing the third party data. So um, you know this might be sometimes might be an easy exercise because what you can do is just make appropriate redactions. However, that might not always be a solution because there is, um, you know, there will be cases where even if you redact someone's name, the rest of the stuff that has been said in whatever document or email that you're disclosing actually makes it quite obvious who the individual is and it would be very easy to identify the third party individual. So um, what the DPA says, the Data Protection Act, is that you don't have to disclose such information um, unless either the other individual has consented to such disclosure or it is reasonable nonetheless to comply with the request even without the other individual's consent. So uh, unfortunately, as I said, there's no straight answer, but what you will be required to do is undertake a balancing exercise. And there are a number of factors that you will need to consider, um, which are set out in the Act. And again, there's useful ICO guidance on this. Um, so, you know, you might, you that there, it's not a closed list and there's lots of things you will need to think about, but one of them is, or some of them are, uh, you know, the type of information that you would be disclosing, any duty of confidentiality you might have with the third party, um, you know, any steps that you've taken to actually try and speak to the third party and ascertain whether or not they would be comfortable or whether or not they would consent to their information being disclosed in such a way. Um, so these are all the things you need to consider. And um, I think Matt and John have, you know, touched on this already, but it's very important when you go through this kind of process to document somewhere what decision you've taken and why, because uh, these things, you know, often down the line lead to some sort of complaint. And there, you know, there's nothing better than having a contemporaneous record of what you've done and why you've done it to sort of, um, uh, you know, alleviate any concerns that an, the ICO might have if they are then investigating this sometime down the line. Um, right, so then the final other exemption is actually a whole list of exemptions which are carved out specifically in the legislation. Um, I'm not going to go through this um, in any detail. Um, I know that there was a question about this in the chat, which I've tried to answer. But in effect, this includes a whole um, range of things that are very specifically carved out and it's all very context specific. So, you know, please, again, if you are thinking of relying on them, please consider ICO guidance. But it, you know, the things that crop up most frequently are things like data that is caught by legal professional privilege and also personal data that is processed for crime um, related purposes. So if you're you know, investigating for the purpose of preventing crime or detecting crime, then again, that, that personal data is um, exempt from a subject access request. Um, turning then to procedure, um, what's um, not on my next slide is that, um, and something that Matt has mentioned is that the request can be made in any form. So like it could be on social media, it could be made verbally. So you do need to ensure that you've got a proper system of recording any requests that are being made. Um, but then joking quickly about time limit, this is um, the, the, the statute has that it must be complied with, with un, without undue delay and at least within one month of receiving the request. It is possible to extend by a further two months, but this is only where the request is um, complex or you have received a number of various requests from an individual, um, you know, on the same day, and it would just be impossible to get back to all of them within a month. In terms of fees, as a general rule, you cannot charge fees, but um, again, there are some exemptions and you can charge a reasonable fee for the administrative costs of complying with a request that is manifestly unfounded or excessive. Although bear in mind that you could obviously just refuse the request and then you're not gonna think about fees in any event. Um, and also you can charge reasonable fees where you've provided the information already, but an individual has come back to you and said, um, can I have a further copy of that data? So that, that's a situation in which you can charge for fees. And then further information, this is um, fairly important because it does affect time limits. But um, firstly, you are entitled and you're encouraged to ask for further information to confirm the individual's identity where you're not confident or you know, unsure about who it might be. Um, you can, as I flagged earlier, also ask the individual to specify or clarify their request where you process a large amount of information. Um, and in both of these cases, just bear in mind that the time limit is effectively stopped until you receive that information back from the individual. Although bear in mind that these tools um, should not simply be used as a delaying tactic and where that has been the case, the ICU you know, looks upon that quite unfavorably. Um, right, so then moving on very quickly to practical tips. Um, 
for the next three minutes. Um, I, you know, that I think a lot of actually what I'm about to say are, you know, common sense things that have actually been covered by Matt and John in any event. But the first thing I would stress is training. Now, this is obviously extremely important, not least because, as I said, requests can be made in any form whatsoever. So all members of staff must be sufficiently trained to actually pick up on what, what might be a subject access request. In my experience, you know, people often make these just on the phone and someone doesn't realize that's a subject access request, but time has started to run. And so then, um, you know, you, one month later, someone will come back saying, well, the time limit is now up and you've not responded to me. And that's quite problematic. So, yes, proper training is key. Um, and then it's not just in terms of picking up a request, but, you know, bear in mind that all your staff at all stages will be processing a large number of personal data. And so they do need to understand the data protection implications of that and ensure proper compliance with the various policies that you have in place, because that will all die back into how you respond to requests. Um, then thinking about good housekeeping, and I just cannot stress enough how important this one is. In my experience, where an organization has, um, you know, good information management systems, good policies in place, proper compliance with the policies, good retention periods, basically all the stuff the match has gone over in terms of accountability principle, it becomes so much easier to respond to a subject access request. Honestly, the sort of nightmare cases that I have usually are cases where actually there's no proper information management system in place. And actually the accountability principle is probably, you know, not being complied with properly, which is why it has become suddenly so onerous to comply with the request. Um, so, yes, I would just stress that, you know, very strongly. And then finally, um, most of you in large organizations and particularly all public bodies will have a designated data protection officer um, and really this person should be your first port of call should you have any questions or if there are any issues with your response you know if, if you're in doubt it's always better to get that advice from your DPO rather than leaving it to later down the line when you know when inevitably you might get a complaint from someone or indeed the ICO is um, you know the, someone complains to the ICO and they come back to you um, and then obviously if all else fails you can um, instruct one of us in providing further assistance so uh, I think that brings me to 12 o'clock um, and I know we said um, that we would try and answer questions I think some questions we've been answering as we've gone along um, but I'm just going to see if further questions have come in um, and indeed if one of the other panel members wants to step in at this stage. Um, Ruchi I was going to uh, take an anonymous question um, about covering data sharing internally, not just with third parties. Um, I think really the principles that apply to data sharing internally and externally are essentially the same, or it's certainly you'd be well advised to adopt a similar approach um, because different departments within a local authority or different teams within, say, a, a, a registered social landlord will be using data for different reasons and they'll potentially have different record management management practices and things like that so i would there are some differences um obviously your it security will probably be similar within the same organization but um have a look at the the best advice i can give the most practical advice i can give is to have a look at the ico's data sharing code of practice really helpful online piece of guidance and it sets out all sorts of things including checklists and you could apply that and it doesn't it does make a distinction between internal and external sharing but um it's not a huge distinction, as I've said, so um, that's probably the advice I would give in the limited time we have available to do this answer. Right, so I think um, unless there are any other matters that any of the speakers want to deal with, it is now a minute past 12. Was there anything that any of you wanted to deal with or are you happy to follow up afterwards as appropriate? I think I'm happy to follow up afterwards. I've just seen two things though that I think we can answer very quickly. Um, but obviously people who do need to leave appreciate that you want to head off and um, lead your lives. Um, but one of the questions was about body worn cameras for officers. And actually, you know, everything that John has already talked about in terms of the underlying principles and how you treat CCTV recordings are the same considerations will apply. I think that's right, isn't it, John? Um, Absolutely. So, you know, you need to be telling people that your body worn camera is on, it's recording, you know, effectively all of the same types of transparency requirements are 
needed and the same type of um, process or um, principles apply in terms of like the recording storage um, and maintenance and sharing of that body worn camera footage. And then um, I just had a question from Astrid about uh, where you have third party data, whether you actually need to seek consent or you can just refuse on the basis of absence of consent. Um, I, um, the, the short answer is um, you can't simply refuse based on the lack of consent without actually um, reaching out and make you know taking some steps. As I said, there is a list of factors that you must consider in the act, and one of them is what steps you've taken to ascertain whether the other individual would consent. So unfortunately, you do have to um, make some efforts there. And I would say even if you don't have consent, if consent isn't forthcoming, there may still be um, a reason why it's reasonable to share to to comply with the subject access request. So consent is not sort of a, a trump card either. Um, in that process. Yes, absolutely. Um, right, so I think um, that's probably all we have time for, Kulja, if I can just hand back to you. Thank you very much to all of you. That was um, incredibly informative. Just to say thank you very much to all of the delegates to, for joining us. There is a recording available if you missed any of the content. And as I said, um, do get in touch if there are any topics that you'd like us to consider in our forthcoming seminar program. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.